So just to kind of recap, because I know we took some days off. So far, what has Lewis done in this book? Well, he's set out two views for us. Naturalism and supernaturalism. Naturalism is the view that everything that exists is part and parcel of nature, or the whole show, as he calls it. The other is supernaturalism. Things other than nature exist. Maybe you think ghosts, or God, or demons, or other supernatural entities exist. The reason why Lewis is bringing this up is because the book is about whether miracles are possible and whether they actually happen or have happened in human history. What we're going to see in this chapter, chapter 3, is Lewis providing an argument for why if we're going to be rational people and use reason and logical argumentation to try to arrive at the truth, there is an inherent difficulty with the naturalist viewpoint in doing that. So, we're going to try to read through this chapter, see how far we get, and I'm going to play some videos for you that are going to provide some arguments as to why this view of naturalism, which is kind of con held by the contemporary scientific community, is thought to be, you know, this is the right way to look at things, either cannot be known or it cannot be justified using reason. So, let's continue with chapter 3. We cannot have it both ways, and no sneers at the limitations of logic amend the dilemma. And so Lewis begins, If naturalism is true, every finite thing or event must be in principle explicable in terms of the total system or the whole show. I say explicable in principle because, of course, we are not going to demand that naturalists at any given moment should have found the detailed explanation of everything. Obviously, many things will only be explained when the sciences have made further progress. Right? I think we can all concede science has not managed to explain everything yet. Right? But maybe you have hope that it will be able to, or that it can. But if naturalism is to be accepted, we have a right to demand that every single thing should be such that we see, in general, how it could be explained in terms of the total system. If any one thing exists, which is of such a kind that we see in advance the impossibility of ever getting it that kind of explanation, then naturalism would be in ruins. If necessities of thought force us to allow to any one thing any degree of independence from the total system, if any one thing makes good a claim to be on its own, to be something more than an expression of the character of nature as a whole, then we have abandoned naturalism. For by naturalism we mean the doctrine that only nature, the whole interlocked thing or system, exists. And if that were true, everything and event would, if we knew enough, be explicable without remainder as a necessary product of the system. The whole system being what it is, it ought to be a contradiction in terms if you are not reading this book at the moment. And conversely, the only cause why you are reading it ought to be the whole system. At such and such a place, an hour was bound to take that course. One threat against strict naturalism has recently been launched, on which I myself will base no argument, but which it will be well to notice. The older scientists believed that the smallest particles of matter moved according to strict laws. In other words, that the movements of each particle were interlocked with the total system of nature. Some modern scientists, however, seem to think, if I understand them, that this is not so. They seem to think that the individual unit of matter moves in an indeterminate or random fashion moves, uh, in fact, on its own, or of its own accord. The regularity which we observe in the movements of the smallest visible bodies 
is explained by the fact that each of these contains millions of units and that the law of averages therefore levels out the idiosyncrasies of the individual unit's behavior. The movement of one unit is incalculable, just as the result of tossing a coin once is incalculable. The majority movement of a billion units can, however, be predicted, just as if you tossed a coin a billion times, you could predict a nearly equal number of heads and tails. Okay, so is this an idea you've heard before? Do you know what argument he's bringing up here? If you know anything about the history of physics, that'll clue you into what there is debate about nowadays. About why everything is the way that it is. You've heard of this thing called quantum mechanics, right? Okay, now we're talking about higher level physics stuff. A lot of scientists think nowadays that based on the experiments that we have, there might not be deterministic laws that, well, determine how a wave function is going to collapse or how a more, uh, wave is going to move through space. This is known as quantum indeterminacy. This is what Lewis is bringing up here. Quantum indeterminacy, uh, and to go along with this, things like the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, seem to imply that reality is part of its nature like fuzzy. Have you ever heard this idea that you cannot know both the position and the velocity of a particle at the same time? That's related to this idea. So although we think that objects in our universe have a definite place in the manifold of space-time, when we get down to like subatomic units, what we've come to realize is there's, it's really weird. There's like this inherent fuzziness to things. And what seems to govern how a wave function uh, progresses and evolves has to do with probability and probability distributions. Now that is weird. And the argument that he's kind of implying here is if the basic units of reality are inherently fuzzy or indeterministic, it would seem that we can't explain everything in terms of the whole system. There's a lack of an underlying principle or law or how we would explain like how things move and wave functions and how they collapse. We'd have to discuss or reference something outside of the total system or total show. Thus he says, now it will be noticed that if this theory is true, we have really admitted something other than nature. If the movements of the individual units, what we could call subatomic particles or waves, are events on their own, events which do not interlock with all other events, then these movements are not a part of nature. It would be indeed too great a shock to our habits to describe them as supernatural. I think we should have to call them subnatural. But all our confidence that nature has no doors and no reality outside herself for doors to open on would have disappeared. There is apparently something outside her, if quantum mechanics is true, the subnatural. It is indeed from this subnatural that all events and all bodies are, as it were, fed into her. And clearly, if she thus has a back door opening on the subnatural, it is quite on the cards that she may also have a front door opening on the supernatural. And events might be fed into her at that door, too. Thus, what he's trying to say here is recent discoveries and research into the sciences, into physics more specifically, seem to imply that something outside of nature influences it, or the cause is not explicable in terms of the whole show.
what we know about the whole show. Now, I'm not going to spend too much time discussing this view because I don't know enough about quantum mechanics and indeterminacy and all that, but it's something interesting to consider. I have mentioned this theory because it puts in a fairly vivid light certain conceptions, which we shall have to use later on. But I am not, for my own part, assuming its truth. Those who, like myself, have had a philosophical rather than a scientific education find it almost impossible to believe that the scientists really mean what they seem to be saying. I cannot help thinking they mean no more than that the movements of individual units are permanently incalculable to us, not that they are in themselves random and lawless. And even if they mean the latter, a layman can hardly feel any certainty that some new scientific development may not tomorrow abolish this whole idea of a lawless subnature. For it is the glory of science to progress. I therefore turn willingly to other ground. So this is a contemporary debate happening among researchers and scientists. Whether or not there are hidden variables that are determining the character of wave functions and how they evolve and all that stuff, or whether or not it's just random chance how this stuff is manifesting and what happens. That is a debate that's being had right now. In any case, that's not the argument we're, we're going to spend time considering today. It's coming up here. He says, It is clear that everything we know beyond our own immediate sensations is inferred from those sensations. I do not mean that we begin as children by regarding our sensations as evidence and thence arguing consciously to the existence of space, matter, and other people. I mean that if after we are old enough to understand the question, our confidence in the existence of anything else, say the solar system or the Spanish Armada, is challenged, our argument in defense of it will have to take the form of inferences from immediate sensations. So this is something that we've already seen, right? In Russell and Descartes and stuff. Put in its most general form, the inference would want run, since I am presented with colors, sounds, shapes, pleasures, and pains, which I cannot perfectly predict or control, and since the more I investigate them, the more regular their behavior appears, therefore there must exist something other than myself, and it must be systematic. Inside this very general inference, all sorts of special trains of inference lead us to more detailed conclusions. We infer evolution from fossils. We infer the existence of our own brains from what we find inside the skulls of other creatures, like ourselves in the dissecting room. All possible knowledge, then, depends on the validity of reasoning. If the feeling of certainty which we express by words like must be, and therefore and since, is a real perception of how things outside our own minds really must be, well and good. But if this certainty is merely a feeling in our own minds and not a genuine insight into realities beyond them, if it merely represents the way our minds happen to work, then we can have no knowledge. Unless human reasoning is valid, no science can be true. So what he's setting up here is the following idea. Naturalism is a view about the universe that we've come to through reasoning. We presume that, well, our we reasoning works in a particular way, and it's allowing us to track reality, and it's allowing us to get to the truth. But what he's going to present to us next is an idea that if naturalism is true, you don't have a good reason to believe that it is true. So let's, let's see what he says. It follows that no account of the universe can be true unless that account leaves it possible for our thinking to be a real insight. A theory which explained everything else in the whole universe, but which made it impossible to believe that our thinking was valid, would be utterly out of court. 
for that theory would itself have been reached by thinking. And if thinking is not valid, that theory would, of course, be itself demolished. It would have destroyed its own credentials. It would be an argument which proved that no argument was sound, a proof that there are no such things as proofs, which is nonsense. Thus, a strict materialism refutes itself for the reason given long ago by Professor Haldane. If my mental processes are determined wholly by the motions of atoms in my brain, I have no reason to suppose that my beliefs are true. And hence, I have no reason for supposing my brain to be composed of atoms. So this is what's known as the materialistic argument against knowledge. Let's say, for example, that again, you are just a thing composed of matter, material stuff. Particles and waves operating according to natural laws. What would that mean? Well, that would mean that you have certain beliefs and views just because of what your atoms in your brain are doing. Do you have any control over what the atoms in your brain are doing? Then it would seem like any belief that you have, if it is true, is just a happy accident. Right? So, that's an interesting argument. If materialism is true, you don't have any good reason to believe in it. Why? Any belief in it would be a happy accident, not the result of rational reasoning. Just, oh, that's just what the particles made you think. Okay, so what do you think about that? <laughs> Is that a good argument? You like that argument? If everything you think and believe is just what your brain is making you do, following certain natural deterministic laws, do you have any good reason to think that your beliefs are true? Well, like, why are we able to think in like systems of thinking, like we're in this class sort of thing? Yeah. Things that are related to this class. Why don't we just think of like random stuff? Well, we're just being determined to think on this view, what we think. But if it was totally random, wouldn't we just have random thoughts? It might not be totally random, yeah. He's not saying, he doesn't think it's random. He's not going to put forth the view that our thinking is just chancy and random and due to luck. He doesn't believe that. But the view that he's bringing up here is if you take the contemporary scientific view, all this is made of matter, you know, if we knew what the conditions were like at the Big Bang, we could in principle predict everything that would happen, he'd say you have no reason to think that your beliefs about the nature of reality are true. Why? You're just determined to believe what you believe and think what you think. If you have no control over it. Ah, so predetermined is different than determined. So, and then another thing philosophers might say is, well, what's special about people in contrast to animals is that we are reasons responsive. What that means is that we have cognitive architecture that is responsive to reasons. So if I maybe give you a good reason to believe something, you'll believe it. But what the materialist view is going to imply is you don't have any control over that. It's just like if I present you with the right reason in the right way, that's going to cause you to have a certain belief. Okay, so maybe just let that sit, reflect on that. The main argument we're going to discuss is coming up next. Maybe you don't believe that it's all made of just matter. Maybe there's more to things than that. But let's say you're still a naturalist. Okay? Let's say you just think all oh, this is natural. 
It's all part and parcel of nature. There's no God. There's nothing supernatural. There's nothing subnatural. None of that. Okay? What does Lewis say? Naturalism, even if it is not purely materialistic, seems to me to involve the same difficulty, though in a somewhat less obvious form. It discredits our processes of reasoning, or at least reduces their credit to such a humble level that it can no longer support naturalism itself. The easiest way of exhibiting this is to notice the two senses of the word because. We can say, grandfather is ill today because he ate lobster yesterday. We can also say, grandfather must be ill today because he hasn't got up yet. And we know he is an invariably early riser when he is well. In the first sentence, because indicates the relation of cause and effect. The eating made him ill. In the second, it indicates the relation of what logicians call ground and consequent. The old man's late rising is not the cause of his disorder, but the reason why we believe him to be disordered. There is a similar difference between he cried out because it hurt him, cause and effect, and it must have hurt him because he cried out, ground and consequent. We are especially familiar with ground and consequent because in mathematical reasoning, a equals C because, as we have already proved, they are both equal to B. The one indicates a dynamic connection between events or states of affairs. The other, a logical relation between beliefs or assertions. Now, a train of reasoning has no value as a means of finding truth unless each step in it is connected with what went before in this logical way. If our B does not follow logically from our A, we think in vain. If what we think at the end of our reasoning is to be true, the correct answer to the question, why do you think this, must begin with the ground consequent because. Or by talking about the logic, you know, the train of logic. On the other hand, every event in nature must be connected with previous events in the cause and effect relation. But our acts of thinking are events. Therefore, the true answer to why do you think, according to naturalism, must begin with the cause effect because. Unless our conclusion is the logical consequent from a ground, it will be worthless and could be true only by a fluke. Unless it is the effect of a cause, it cannot occur at all. It looks, therefore, as if, in order for a train of thought to have any value, these two systems of connection must apply simultaneously to the same series of mental acts. But unfortunately, the two systems are wholly distinct. To be caused is not to be proved. Let's say I put a microchip in your brain, and I press a button, and I cause you to have a certain belief. Does that mean you have good reason to have that belief? If I just cause you to have it by pressing a button. No, right? And Lewis is going to say, actually, when we talk about certain beliefs being caused in people, we take that as evidence that they don't have good reason to believe the thing they believe. They were just caused to have it. There's no relation between you happening to have a certain belief and you getting there based on logic. To be caused is not to be proved. Wishful thinkings, prejudices, and the delusions of madness are all caused, but they are ungrounded, logically. Indeed, to be caused is so different from being proved that we behave in disputation as if they were mutually exclusive. The mere existence of causes for a belief is popularly treated as raising a presumption that it is groundless. And most, the most popular way of discrediting a person's opinions is to explain them causally. You say that because you are a capitalist, or a hypochondriac, or a mere man, or only a woman. The implication here 
is that if causes fully account for a belief, then since causes work inevitably, the belief would have had to arise whether it had logical grounds or not. We need not, it is felt, consider grounds for something which can be fully explained without them. But even if grounds do exist, what exactly have they got to do with the actual occurrence of a belief as a psychological event? If it is an event, it must be caused. It must, in fact, be simply one link in a causal chain which stretches back to the beginning and forward to the end of time. How could such a trifle as lack of logical grounds prevent the belief's occurrence? Or how could the existence of grounds promote it? There seems to be only one possible answer. We must say that just as one way in which a mental event causes a subsequent mental event by association, so another way in which it can cause it is simply by being a ground for it. For then being a cause and being a proof would coincide. But this, as it stands, is clearly untrue. We know by experience that a thought does not necessarily cause all or even any of the thoughts which logically stand to it as consequence stand to ground. We should be in a pretty pickle if we can never think this is a class without drawing all the inferences which could be drawn from it. It is impossible to draw them all. Quite often we draw none. We must therefore amend our suggested law. One thought can cause another not by being, but by being seen to be a ground for it. If you distrust this sensory metaphor, seen, you may substitute apprehended or grasped or simply known. It makes little difference for all these words, recall to us what thinking really is. Acts of thinking are no doubt events, but they are a special sort of events. They are about something other than themselves and can be true or false. Events in general are not about anything and cannot be true or false. To say these events or facts are false means, of course, that someone's account of them is false. Hence, acts of inference can and must be considered in two different lights. On the one hand, they are subjective events, items in somebody's psychological history. On the other hand, they are insights into or knowings of something other than themselves. What from the first point of view is the psychological transition from thought A to thought B at some particular moment in some particular mind is from the thinker's point of view a perception of an implication. If A, then B. When we are adopting the psychological point of view, we may use the past tense. B followed A in my thoughts. But when we assert the implication, we always use the present. B follows from A, logically. If it ever follows from in the logical sense, it does so always. And we cannot possibly reject the second point of view as a subjective illusion without discrediting all human knowledge. For we can know nothing beyond our own sensations at the moment unless the act of inference is the real insight it claims to be. But, and this is an important but, it can be this only on certain terms. An act of knowing must be determined in a sense solely by what is known. We must know it to be thus solely because it is thus. That is what knowing means. You may call this a cause and effect because, and call being known a mode of causation if you like, but it is a unique mode. The act of knowing has no doubt various conditions, without which it could not occur. Attention, and the states of the will, and health, which this presupposes. But its positive character must be determined by the truth it knows. If it were totally explicable from other sources, say, biological and chemical reactions in your brain, it would cease to be knowledge, just as the ringing in my ears ceases to be what we mean by hearing if it can be fully explained from causes other than a noise in the outer world, such as, say, the tinnitus produced by a bad cold. 
If what seems an act of knowledge is partially explicable from other sources, then the knowing, properly so called in it, is just what they leave over, just what demands for its explanation, the thing known, as real hearing is what is left after you have discounted the tinnitus. Anything which professes to explain our reasoning fully without introducing an act of knowing, thus solely determined by what is known, is really a theory that there is no reasoning at all. But this, as it seems to me, is what naturalism is bound to do. It offers what professes to be a full account of our mental behavior, but this account on inspection leaves no room for the acts of knowing or insight on which the whole value of our thinking as a means to truth depends. Okay, so does anybody see the argument that he's making? This is a hard argument, okay? This is like tricky meta-level thinking about thinking stuff. We have to derive knowledge from the outside world because if we get it from our brain, then it's not really knowledge because it's just He uses an example, but that's just one piece in his logical argument. So, I guess the way that we could reframe that is, our thinking needs to be a particular way if we're going to claim to have knowledge or reason to believe something. If I put, to use the previous example, a microchip in your brain and I pressed a button and that just caused you to believe that the sky is blue, would you say you know that the sky is blue? That's what C.S. Lewis is trying to say, something like that. If your beliefs or thoughts, if we can just explain them in terms of physical causes, chemical reactions, biological reactions, you don't have a reason to believe what you believe in that instance. You don't have a justification for it. And he would even say, we wouldn't even call that knowledge. Unless you reasoned on the basis of you know, what you see or logic that the sky is blue, if I just caused you to have that belief, you wouldn't have a reason to believe it. It wouldn't be logical or rational to believe that. But this is what he's going to say is what naturalism implies. He's going to say this view that everything is a part of nature that follows these physical laws, that applies to acts of thinking too. So, the thoughts and beliefs that you all have, if naturalism is true, is just because of what particles and chemical reactions are doing. Thus, do you have any good reason to believe anything? Any justification for your views? You've just been caused to have them by what your brain is doing. So, naturalism undermines itself. If you think it's true, you don't have any good reason to believe it because you're just caused to believe it. That's the overall argument that he's making. To make it clearer, check this out, okay? I have a short little video for you. Hopefully this will make it a little clearer. The late Christopher Hitchens, when asked, does he believe in free will, replied, I have no choice. <laughs> it, it's a question that I've read, actually, because I, 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 I don't have a very well thought out uh, view about it. I think that, I mean, I have a materialist view of 
the world. I think that, um, that things are determined in a rational way by antecedent events. Um, and so that commits me to the view that uh, when I think I have free will, I think that I am exercising free, free choice. I'm deluding myself um, that, that I'm, my, my brain states are determined by physical events. And, and yet, that seems to contradict to go against the very powerful subjective impression that we all have, um, that, we, that we really do have, have uh, free will. Um, I think all I can do is, is recommend the works of my colleague Daniel Bennett on, on, on the subject, which are fascinating. And this is a new book by another one called The Inheritance of the World. Yes, I also have to agree that I think, I don't, I think the, everything everyone in the world tells me about the world's history of their life. I, I do think, and, you know, but we ask that the world be made as if there's free will, and so it doesn't make much difference. Just like um, the particles in a, in, in a, in a room, don't, we can discuss them statistically, and they behave as if they can do things that they're not being forced to do, which is statistic. And, and we behave as if we have free will because we live in a very complex world where there's so many factors influencing any of our decisions that you can't trace you can't trace that free will down to the source. And so it isn't see the world where we act as if we have free will or looks like we have free will when we really do. In my mind, it's so minimal that it's a question for philosophy to worry about it, not not me. Um, and maybe with that, uh, with that, we will thank you very much. Okay, so this is the contemporary scientific view, right? The naturalistic, materialistic view. The reason why things are the way they are is because of how matter behaves according to certain laws of nature. What that would imply is the reason you have the thoughts and feelings and beliefs that you do is because of what particles are doing in your brain. So, if you believe you have free will, well, that's probably not true, right? You're deluding, it's an illusion, you're deluding yourself into thinking that, because well, you're just going to believe whatever the particles make you believe, however they're behaving and interacting. Now, when it comes to thinking, the same would also apply. The thoughts that you have, the conclusions that you come to, you're determined to come to by what the particles and waves are doing. So that is the view that naturalism seems to imply. Now listen to a rebuttal by the apologist Dr. Greg Bonson as to why there's an issue with this. If naturalism is true, that is, that all that exists is in the natural order, and there isn't anything that goes beyond man's experience in time. If naturalism is true, then the naturalist has no reason to believe his naturalism. You write that down and I'll explain why it's true. If naturalism is true, a naturalist has no reason to believe it. Has no reason to believe it. Just to see, naturalism says all of our thinking is just electrical, chemical responses. All of our thinking is subject to the laws of chemistry and physics. Which is to say, all of our thinking is determined by the factors in the physical world or in the physical brain in the environment around us. All of our thinking is, in principle, predictable then. This is just following the laws of nature. Uh, usually, more sophisticatedly, but the laws of physics and biology and chemistry and so forth. But the point is, human thinking is just a species of the physical world and its operation. Human thinking is just, it's on the same order, but not the same level of sophistication as weeds grow. And so if naturalism is true, then the person who's propounding it is propounding it why? Because his or her brain has required them by the laws of physics and chemistry and biology to say this sort of thing. It's not as though they have the freedom and self-awareness to think about different theories, evaluate evidence, and make a choice as to which is right or wrong. They just have to say whatever they have to say. 
And that's why the irony is that a naturalist would promote naturalism and try to tell people it's true. You should believe that and not supernaturalism. The answer is if naturalism is true, so that your brain is just working on the laws of physics, then you have no reason to believe naturalism is true since the laws of physics require you to say that. Which is just to say if naturalism is true, there's no reason to say that naturalism is true. You're just forced to say that. It's like I'm forced by the laws of physics to say the opposite. Unbelievers cannot even account for why we argue with each other in that family. On their assumptions, there's no argument because there's no freedom to choose the truth over against error. This is the laws of physics governing my brain to say and do whatever it does. Okay, so that's the argument that Lewis is basically making. What do you think about that? Is your mind blown right now? If naturalist materialism is true, well, your brain is just making you think and believe that. You don't have a choice in evaluating the evidence and choosing the right option. You're just kind of forced to believe and say what you believe and say. Therefore, you have no logical reason to believe that naturalism is true. What do you think? Does this sound like a good argument? Can you spot any weaknesses in it? It makes sense? Maybe it's enough to, I don't know, create some doubt? I'm not saying it's true or not. I'm asking you what you think of it. Use those critical thinking skills. Can the naturalist get out of this problem. Well, since y'all are either thinking really hard or dead tired, how about this? What if we bring evolution into this? What if we say, look, like, we are evolved beings. Our capacities to interpret and understand the world have gotten better over time. Um, we're good enough at doing that. Our, our capacities give us the ability to understand at least enough about the natural world because they've been subject to this long selection process where you know what was true enough is what allowed us to continue living right so our capacities have gotten better over time because those mutations that allow us to think better and apprehend the world better have piled up and they've become more instantiated in us. What about that? So maybe you can trust your faculties because, like, look, they've evolved over this very long time period to clue you in more and more into how the world is so you can move and act within it. What about that? Sounds reasonable, right? 
Lewis discusses that next, evolution. Maybe you could fall back on evolution to provide some kind of reliability for the thoughts and beliefs that you have. Let's see what he says. It is agreed on all hands that reason and even sentience and life itself are latecomers in nature. If there is but nothing but nature, therefore, reason must have come into existence by a historical process. And of course, for the naturalist, this process was not designed to produce a mental behavior that can find truth. There was no designer. And indeed, until there were thinkers, there may not have been truth or falsehood. The type of mental behavior we now call rational thinking or inference must therefore have been evolved by natural selection, by the gradual weeding out of types less fitted to survive. This is another part of the contemporary scientific view, right? Materialistic, naturalistic, evolutionary. Once then, our thoughts were not rational. That is, our thoughts once were, as many of our thoughts still are, merely subjective events, not apprehensions of objective truth. Those which had a cause external to ourselves at all were, like our pains, responses to stimuli. Now natural selection could operate only by eliminating responses that were biologically hurtful and multiplying those which tended to survive, survival. But it is not conceivable that any improvement of responses could ever turn them into acts of insight or even remotely tend to do so. The relation between response and stimulus is utterly different from that between knowledge and truth known. Our physical vision is a far more useful response to light than that of the cruder organisms, which have only a photosensitive spot. But neither this improvement nor any possible improvements we can suppose could bring it an inch nearer to being a knowledge of light. It is admittedly something without which we could not have had that knowledge. But the knowledge is achieved by experiments and inferences from them, not by refinement of the evolutionary response. It is not men with specially good eyes who know about light, but men who have studied the relevant sciences. In the same way, our psychological responses to our environment our curiosities, aversions, delights, expectations could be indefinitely improved from the biological point of view without becoming anything more than mere responses, far from amounting to their conversion into valid inferences, might be conceived as a different method of achieving survival, an alternative to reason, a conditioning which secured that we never felt delight except in the useful, nor aversion save from the dangerous, and that the degrees of both were exquisitely proportional to the degree of real utility or danger in the object, might serve us as well as reason or in some circumstances better. Besides natural selection, there is, however, experience. Experience originally individual but handed on by tradition and instruction. It might be held that this, in the course of millennia, could conjure the mental behavior we call reason, in other words, the practice of inference, out of a mental behavior which was originally not rational. Repeated experiences of finding fire or the remains of fire where he had seen smoke would condition a man to expect fire whenever he saw smoke. This expectation, expressed in the form, if smoke, then fire, becomes what we call inference. But have all our inferences originated in that way? But if they did, they are all invalid inferences. Such a process will no doubt produce expectation. It will train men to expect fire when they see smoke in just the same way as it trained them to expect that all swans would be white until they saw a black one, or that water would always boil at 212 degrees until someone tried a picnic on a mountain. Such expectations are not inferences and need not be true. The assumption that things which have been conjoined in the past will always be conjoined in the future 
is the guiding principle not of rational, but of animal behavior. This is what's known as the problem of induction, which we'll talk about at the end of class. Reason comes in precisely when you make the inference since always conjoined, therefore probably connected, and go on to attempt the discovery of the connection. When you have discovered what smoke is, you may then be able to replace the mere expectation of fire by a genuine inference. Till this is done, reason recognizes the expectation as a mere expectation. Where this does not need to be done, that is, where the inference depends on an axiom, we do not appeal to past experience at all. My belief that things which are equal to the same thing are equal to one another is not at all based on the fact that I have never caught them behaving otherwise. I see that it must be so. That some people nowadays call axioms tautologies seems to me irrelevant. Okay, blah, 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 blah. Moving down. If nature is a totally interlocked system, then every true statement about her would be a tautology to an intelligence that could grasp that system in its entirety. But, it will be said, it is incontestable that we do in fact reach, reach truths by inferences. Certainly, the naturalist and I both admit this. We could not discuss anything unless we did. The difference I am submitting is that he gives, and I do not, a history of the evolution of reason, which is inconsistent with the claims that he and I both have to make for inference as we actually practice it. For his history is, and from the nature of the case can only be, an account in cause and effect terms of how people came to think the way they do. And this, of course, leaves in the air the quite different question of how they could possibly be justified in so thinking. This imposes on him the very embarrassing task of trying to show how the evolutionary product, which he has described, could also be a power of seeing truths. But this very attempt is absurd, and I'll shut up here in a second. <laughs> this is best seen if we consider the humblest and the most despairing form in which it could be made. The naturalist might say, well, perhaps we cannot exactly see, not yet, how natural selection would turn subrational mental behavior into inferences that reach truth. But we are certain that this is, has in fact happened. For natural selection is bound to preserve and increase useful behavior. And we also find that our habits of inference are in fact useful. And if they are useful, they must reach truth. But notice what we are doing. Inference itself is on trial. That is, the naturalist has to give an account of what we thought to be our inferences, which suggests that they are not real insights at all. We and he want to be reassured. And the reassurance turns out to be one more inference. If useful, then true. As if this inference were not, once we accept his evolutionary picture, under the same suspicion as all the rest. If the value of our reasoning is in doubt, you cannot try to establish it by reasoning. If, as I said above, a proof that there are no proofs is nonsensical, so is a proof that there are proofs. Reason is our starting point. There can be no question of either attacking or defending it. If by treating it as a mere phenomenon you put yourself outside it, there is then no way, except by begging the question, a fallacy, of getting inside again. So Lewis is asking, according to this naturalist, materialist, evolutionary picture, what justification can you have that history and all of this stuff leads you to think that your views are true. If your views say all this can be explained through cause and effect and matter and motion, what justification do you have for believing any of that? It wasn't something you came to freely by thinking things through. You were just determined to have the thoughts and beliefs that you do. Okay, so do you see the problem? you see the issue here? This is a very strange argument, but I think it's a powerful one. 
we, re- we start with reason and we conclude naturalism, materialism, evolution. But that stuff would seem to undermine us having any good reason or justification for believing in that stuff. Yes? What I find to be real, make it, make it so. For instance, sure. Like my son, he's 12, and uh, dude, he's like so freaking different than I was. <laughs> like I was a little shit at his age, and uh, it's just so. What's real for him? What's real? You know what I mean? It's just two doesn't make one less realistic than the other. Am I following? I kind of, I kind of see what you're saying. Am, 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 I, am I tracking with what you were, you know, what I mean, what you were just discussing? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, the the basic question is like, look, if evolution and naturalism is true, and what we know about physics and biology and chemistry is true, we're just caused to believe those things. So what good reason do we have to believe in them? You know? It would be like me like planting a microchip in your brain, causing you to have the belief that Professor Gunner is the best. And then if somebody asked you, hey, do you have a good reason to believe Professor Gunner is the best? If you're smart, you'd say, no, he just made me have that belief. I just feel a strong way about him. Right? It's just that. Uh, I don't I don't know if you use that phrase, but no, some some true. It's not like it's not like you said anything, but uh, you know, it's just that it's just I just I can't help but to believe that. Well, that's exactly what the naturalist picture is saying. Like you can't help to believe what you're gonna believe. Right. And so when when we're trying to like, you know, look at things objectively and rationally. If we think that's how the world works, we have to concede, I just believe what I believe, and you believe what you believe, and I didn't come to my beliefs freely of a rational reasoning choice. It's just, oh, there it is. I'm also on board that just because it's real to me doesn't make it real. Sure. Because I don't believe that it's real. Yeah. I don't know if I either kind of. No, no, that. Why should I just kind of? No, it's definitely related, yeah. And so what Lewis is presenting here is the argument against naturalism from reason. And then another thing that gets mentioned is what's called the evolutionary argument against naturalism. If you think evolution is true, There are lots of thinkers who think you don't have any good reason to believe that naturalism is true. Why? Consider this. Here's another very short video, a minute long. Ready? See what you make of this argument. The evolutionary argument against naturalism. Your beliefs come from your brain. Where did your brain come from? Maybe it's from evolution. Hi. Now, evolution, do you care about true or false beliefs? Oh, no, I only care about your survival and reproduction. If I can get you to do a survival promoting action, I don't care if you did the action on the basis of true or false beliefs. I don't care if you run away from a tiger because you think it's going to kill you or because you think tigers have black magic. Just that you run away. Well, that's sketchy. So if evolution made a brain, you shouldn't believe it's reliable until we can prove that the brain actually produces the true beliefs rather than useful yet false beliefs. But any proof that you can come up with relies on your brain already being reliable, the very thing in question. So evolution traps us in being unable to trust any of our beliefs. All of this is assuming that evolution is unguided. But if God guides evolution, then he can ensure that our brains would be reliable. The end. Okay, what do you think about that? <laughs> I don't even like I trust them. Like, like what? I don't even know. Like, it's like, I think it was basically saying 
you believe in what you want to believe in, it's not really like true or false. It's just your belief for real. Well, that's what it would seem the contemporary scientific picture implies. But we argue about stuff, right? And we're like, this is true, this is false. You should accept my belief. My belief's the right one. So are like beliefs are like just opinions for you? Mm, they're a little bit different. Um, there's like a bunch of explanations about how they're... But you could think of it like that, yeah. And then he said about um, evolution, he was like, I think he, um, evolution is what like stops, stops us from believing in what we believe in. That's like true, I think. Yeah, yeah, so what he was saying is, if evolution is true, every facet of who you are is geared towards survival and reproduction. Because the survival of the fittest is what persists to reproduce and pass on its genes. But the problem is, if all of our traits are just geared towards survival and reproduction, we that, that means that they're not geared necessarily towards truth and falsity. So, if we think we can come to a true view of the world, we have to assume that, well, survival and reproduction and truth are like the same or sufficiently similar. But we don't have any reason to believe that, right? So in other words, another way you could put this is, if evolution is true, evolution is what is causing you to have the beliefs about it that you do. In other words, how do you know that it's reasonable or justified? Yeah. Evolution, are you referring to? Like the theory of evolution. evolution. Yeah, Darwin, natural selection, all that, yeah. Because, I mean, my thoughts, pain, intuitions have evolved. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah, so what, what the evolutionary theorists are going to say is your brain is geared towards reproduction and survival. The kind of thing that you are. You are molded into a thing that is going to be good for reproduction and survival. But that's very different than being a kind of thing that is aimed towards what is true, right? Wombats have been molded to be very good at surviving and reproducing. Have wombats been geared to know what the truth of the reality is? That's a different thing, right? So, what? yeah, what were you going to say? Oh, it was just like, kind of like what you said about evolution. Like, how do we necessarily know that our beliefs like, are based off of evolution? And you also kind of like said like what I was going to go into with like if our beliefs like are based on evolution and evolution is like the idea of just like trying to live to like reproduce then like how do we know? It's like, how do you know evolution is true? Yeah. How do you know naturalism is true? Yeah, these are really weird puzzles. Because we also right? don't, we don't really know. I mean, we know a little bit, but we don't know everything that came before us. Now we really only know about what is it, like five thousand, ten thousand years. Yeah, like maybe They're even really less because, you know, burning of the Library of Alexandria and all these things. Yeah. And if they have, have explanations, then what do we have to be able to, like, explain, like, all those, like, billions of years of evolution that came prior? Yeah, I mean, we don't have a good explanation of it so far, but may, maybe we'll figure it out, you know. But... If naturalism is true, what we figure out is just what we're determined to think. So then how do we know it's true? And then if evolution is true, well, we, we've we evolved to think that way. And then how do we know that that is on the right track? You know, of what really is, of how things really work. So, Lewis is a Christian apologist, right? He's trying to provide arguments that you don't have good reasons for believing in these views. What do you think? 
you think he's making a good case that this stuff is a little weird? If it's true, you don't have any good reason to believe in it. It's a very weird argument, right? A weird series of arguments. Or to put it this way, this was from a class that I taught a while ago. This is in the context of morality, but consider this. This is basically a recapitulation of the argument just given in the video. This is from Sharon Street, who says, if she's relating to this to morality, if evolution is true, we don't have good reason to believe we know what's objectively good and wrong, or good and bad, morally speaking. But you could apply that to other domains of knowledge as well. Human systems of moral evaluative judgments are thoroughly saturated with evolutionary influence because natural selection has shaped human psychological dispositions. Natural selection selected for those judgments according to biological fitness rather than tracking truths of the realist kind. If human moral beliefs shaped by evolution align with moral truths, then this would be sheer coincidence. So we are not justified in thinking such a coincidence has occurred. Thus, we cannot justifiably believe that our moral beliefs accurately represent independent moral truths. But you could apply this to other stuff as well, right? If all of our characteristics, traits, thought processes, brain chemistry, if all that stuff is a product of evolution, that would seem to, geared towards biological fitness, what reason do we have believe that that lines up or is parallel with tr the true? What is true? Our ability to know what's true. These are puzzles, man. Like they're really hard to, to unpack and try to discuss. You all have any thoughts about them? You're like, I'm completely lost. I don't know any what's going on at all. Yeah. I think it takes us back to, uh, I forget who it was, the meditations. Descartes, yeah. yeah. Where, um, where if we don't believe that what we know is true, then what can we believe? You know? it, it would seem like, at least according to Lewis, if we accept naturalism, evolution, and materialism, yeah, that would cause us to doubt, like, a lot of things. Yeah. Possibly even doubt our consciousness, which Descartes says we can... Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, there are some philosophers who think that consciousness is an illusion. It doesn't exist. That the self doesn't even exist. Because I don't know. Can there be, like, a self if you're just a composite of atoms where's the you in there i don't know so yeah this raises a lot of very difficult philosophical puzzles in any case to reiterate we've kind of looked at three arguments we've looked at the argument against naturalism from reason that was what lewis presented we looked at the evolutionary argument against naturalism. And then in the Bonson video, we kind of looked at the argument against knowledge from naturalistic determinism. If your thoughts and beliefs are just determined, then you don't have good reason to believe or, or accept them. You're just determined to have them based on what your brain chemistry is doing. And you could believe all this, right? Like, maybe all of that is true. But what Lewis is trying to argue is, if all that is true, we could not know it is true, and we wouldn't have any good reason to think it's true. 
But it could all be true. So, does anybody have any thoughts? Or are you just like, I don't know what the hell is going on? Yes? Well, look, you're in good company. This is stuff that people are still trying to work out and figure out. Like, And there are articles and all these things being written all the time. Oh, another argument against this. Oh, your argument's trash. Look at this, you know? Yeah, this is... Like, look, I, I don't know what the hell is true when it comes to a lot of things, so I think you're in good company. I, yeah, it's, it's a very interesting argument. Okay, let's just see if we can finish some more of this. How much time do we have left? Two minutes. Two minutes, okay. Do we need the attendance sheet or no? No, don't worry about that. In any case... I would advise you to reread this chapter. Again, what Lewis is trying to argue is if naturalism is true, you don't have any good reason to believe it. And you couldn't know that it's true. That's another thing that he's implying here. And so he says at the very end of this chapter, this is the pri- thinking and reasoning is the prime reality on which the attribution of reality to anything else rests. If our thinking cannot be made sense of by naturalism, we can't help it. We will certainly not on that account give it up. If we do, we should be giving up nature too. And thus he's going to argue on these viewpoints that we've been discussing, the positions undermine themselves in a certain way. And so think hard about that. Think hard about whether or not these are good arguments. I would highly encourage all of you to look up this video as well. And maybe I'll just send it to you all. This is Alvin Plantinga, Christian apologist. The evolutionary argument against naturalism. He's going to go off on it more in this video. About how if evolution is true, that seems to imply we don't have any justification or reason to believe that naturalism is true. Which is an interesting view. Okay. All right, any questions, concerns, comments? We'll try to look at chapters 4 and 5 on Thursday. We're probably not going to finish it. Okay, well, thank you for coming. I hope you got something out of this. We'll be transitioning to easier content in the next unit. I realize this is very difficult and meta. So, All right, thank you.